the Holy Spirit to be at work in us as we gather here this morning, to be at work in our lives, to be speaking to us, into our situations and circumstances of our lives, bringing the word that we need to hear, bringing the help, the energy, the power, all of those things that we need to get through life day by day. That's our primary goal here this morning, to allow God to be at work in us as he shares with us and speaks to us. So the Holy Spirit, just a reminder, the Holy Spirit is a spiritual being who is fully God. Uh, God is a trinity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is uh, he who comes to live in us when we turn to Jesus and give our lives to God. He is the person through whom God is active, uh, and he is the one by whom we enjoy and experience all the blessings of the kingdom of God. And we've looked at uh, these symbols, uh, there's five uh, regular symbols of the Holy Spirit uh, through the Bible. Dove, we, we were reminded, the dove is a reminder that the Holy Spirit is gentle and kind, that he's patient with us, that he, he never forces himself upon us, but he waits for us to say yes to him, uh, and that he can bring peace in all circumstances of our lives. We then looked at wind, a reminder that the Holy Spirit is uncontainable and uncontrollable and unpredictable, but entirely reliable. That we may not expect or know what to expect the Holy Spirit is going to do, but he is always doing the work of God in our lives, which is always for our best, one way or another. In the third week, Dave uh, spoke about oil. Uh, the, the sense of the Holy Spirit being lavishly poured upon us. The anointing uh, in the Old Testament was a pouring on of oil. That sense of, of, of um, the place of anointing being the place where heaven meets earth. Uh, and therefore, as we receive the Holy Spirit, so we become that place. Uh, last week, water. As well as a physical thirst, God has given us a spiritual thirst, a thirst for him. And this thirst is only quenched through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Our desperation to meet with God is met in practice by our relationship with the Holy Spirit in us and our engagement with him. Uh, can I encourage you, if, you ha if you've missed any of those, they're all available uh, on our YouTube channel. Do take the opportunity to catch up uh, online if you've missed any, or take the opportunity to listen again if you want to continue to ponder on uh, the Holy Spirit's work in us. So finally, uh, week five, Holy Spirit as fire. Let me take you on a little journey uh, through... Uh, the story of the Holy Spirit's arrival as fire. So in Matthew 3, 11, John the Baptist is baptizing the, um, the Jewish people and he says this to them, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have this word from John the Baptist about Jesus who uh, is on his way, he's, he's around, and shortly after that, he comes into the picture fully. But uh, John the Baptist makes this promise that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. I'm guessing that's where the phrase baptism of fire comes from, that we uh, hear used in a variety of ways. But Holy Spirit and fire is John's words. Then Jesus, uh, at the beginning of Acts, he says this to his disciples, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Here, he, it's almost like Jesus is linking back to those words of John, where John said, I'll baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Spirit and fire. And Jesus says to the disciples, it's happening now. As John baptized with water, so you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, Acts 2, start of the next chapter, we see that happen. When the day of Pentecost came, they, the disciples, were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire 
that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Here is that moment, right back from the promise of John the Baptist, from the words of Jesus. Here comes the fire of the Holy Spirit and they are filled with the Spirit. There were around 120 people, we believe, in that room. We think sometimes perhaps that was just the the 11 remaining disciples or the 12, they'd picked another one at the end of chapter 1, but it says all of them, and the all of them is uh, around 120 believers as there were at that point. Imagine that scene, 120 people in a room, this incredible noise of the wind comes uh, and they don't know what it is and they're kind of on full alert, what on earth is that and what is happening? And then amongst them, in the midst of them, 120 tongues of fire, I mean, picture it, appear, And then those tongues of fire separate from each other and move around the room and rest on the head of each person there. What were they feeling? What were they thinking? What were they saying? Uh, Have you got one? I've got one. Oh, you've got one. Just imagine the scene as the Holy Spirit comes and fills them. And notice, and I mentioned this in a previous week, but I'll say it again. Every head, the Holy Spirit, the, the flames came on every head. Nobody missed out. There was, no, there was no selectiveness. God isn't always selective with who he calls. You're all looking at me thinking, yes, we know that really well. <laughs> New believers, gifted speakers, background servers, all of them received the Holy Spirit and were filled. Not one was missed out. This is for all of us who know and follow Jesus. So what does this mean? Why tongues of fire on people's heads? What's going on? What what is that symbolizing? What is it representing? There's no record of that ever having happened previously uh, anywhere in the Bible. But what we do know from the Old Testament is that often the, the people's experience of the presence of God was in fire so just a few examples just from exodus exodus chapter 3 moses the angel of the lord appeared to moses in flames of fire from within a bush if we can just have the verses up if you can that's all right Um, so the angel of the lord uh, the angel of the lord in the old testament represents the very presence of god it wasn't just an angel it was specifically representing god's presence Uh, And so the angel of the Lord appears in flames of fire to Moses from within a bush. Verse uh, chapter 13 uh, talks about how how God guided the Israelites by by a cloud by day and then by fire by night. So again, the presence of God in fire. Uh, It specifically says uh, um, to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire. God's presence. Exodus 19. The whole nation come to Mount Sinai uh, and God comes down onto the mountain and again it says he came down in fire in front of the people. So, so there was this, uh, there's this connection that when, when God's presence comes there is often fire is a part of that picture. And then too, as we look at God's dwelling places on earth, first of all they had the tabernacle, which was like a movable temple that they could build and pick up and move and and rebuild. Uh, And when they first completed the tabernacle and God's presence came, it says that God came as a fire over the tabernacle at night. So there was fire on top of the tabernacle when it went dark. So again, representing God's presence. Then two chronicles, the temple. Now we've moved from the tabernacle. They've settled in the promised land. They build the temple and it says this in, chap- in chapter 7, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of God filled the temple. Fire is one of the indications of God's dwelling place on earth. And what is the first time that we see God come in fire in the New Testament? It's here in Acts 2 where we've just been reading. As Jesus, God ascends to heaven, and then as the Holy Spirit, God returns in fire. 
in tongues of fire. The fire which represents the presence of God is now sitting on the heads of people. This has never happened before. That God's presence has been seen in bushes and mountains and altars and tabernacles and temples, but never God's presence by fire on people. This is a profound message from God to those first disciples and to us today. My dwelling place on earth is now in you. It's truly remarkable if we can get our heads around it. This is no longer God's general dwelling place over there somewhere where we can go to. This is a personal dwelling place within us who know him. This is no longer based on on rules and rituals, but based on relationship. Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives among you. So if you know and follow Jesus this morning, you are the dwelling place of God on earth. And I, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, we know that, don't we, Nigel? We've heard this many times before. We're aware of that. But I wonder if we quite get it. And I speak of to myself too. Because I believe that a genuine understanding that the Almighty God lives in me by His Spirit changes everything about who I am and what I do. We've just sung in that bridge of that last song, let us, come, let us become more aware of your presence. I think that's a word that God has for us this morning. Where you go, God goes. When you walk into the room, God's presence is in that room through you. And as we see throughout God's word, wherever God turns up, the atmosphere changes. You you don't know what a room, what was going on in a room before you walk in, but when God turns up, remarkable things happen. And so for us, this is, I guess, about that sense of are we willing and able to let God have his way in our lives? That in all the situations that we allow God to be present with us, to be active in us, to be working through us, to say yes to that work of the Holy Spirit, that in each situation we will allow God to be God in us and through us. Because I believe incredible things will happen as we lean into that and as we recognize that. So God's dwelling place on earth, his presence with us. The second uh, key work of fire, I hope you've noticed, there are three points and they all begin with the same letter. Thank you very much. I've finally made it as a Baptist. It's taken me many years, three points beginning. Come on, that's a remarkable thing. And I didn't, it just happened. I didn't even think, oh, hang on, I need another P. It was like, it was just that. So the second one is purity. Another key work of fire that we experience through the work of the Holy Spirit. Just turn, if you have a Bible with you, to Romans chapter 3. If you uh, don't have a Bible, you can. There are some at the back, both upstairs and down. Uh, Feel free to grab one or pop your hand up. Someone will bring you one. But just turn with me to Romans 3. Just want to have a look at a passage in in there as we think about the the work of purity that the Holy Spirit does in us. In verse 10 of Romans 3, it says this, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. We are not, in and of ourselves, a pure people. Each of us is impure in a variety of different ways. So how is it possible that a holy and perfect God can dwell, as we've just been learning, in an unholy and imperfect people. How, how can God continue to be holy if he moves in with unholiness and imperfection? Well, we can, we can find out how a few further verses down, down to verse 20. Paul continues uh, with these words, 
verse 20, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So essentially, the, the law that God has given, his, his rules for how to live well and make the most out of life, we cannot keep them in and of ourselves. And so they stand against us. And actually what they do, rather than help us, in one sense is they just make us conscious of what a waste, waste of time we are, how often we get it wrong and what a mess we make of things. So the law stands against us. But 21, but now, apart from the law... The righteousness of God, that's another word for purity, righteousness, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The law and the prophets is essentially the, the whole of the, the writings of the Old Testament. They all testify, they all point towards another righteousness that isn't based on us and what we are able to do. It's not our righteousness at all, according to Paul. It is the righteousness of God. In other words, it's a perfect, pure, holy righteousness, because it's God's righteousness. Verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Again, a profound statement if we can get our heads around it. The righteousness of God, his perfection, his purity, his holiness is given to us what do we have to do for that? We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ and trust in him. That is all it takes. That we turn from our way of doing things, that we turn to Christ, that we say, uh, I want to know and follow you, that we give him our lives. Then as we do that, God's righteousness is given to us through that faith that we have. It's an incredible thing. And so, verse 22 continues, there is no difference between Jew and and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All have sinned, that's each one of us, all of us are impure, unholy, imperfect, and all are justifi justified freely by grace as we put our trust in Jesus, a free justification made, uh, that's a, a holy standing before God. Justification is a, is a standing before God. We are justified. It, it literally means declared not guilty. So we are freed of those impurities and those imperfections and that unholiness. And we are instead righteous. So God doesn't just take the dirt of our sin away from us, he replaces it with his perfect and pure righteousness. It's, it's known sometimes as the great exchange. Our sin and dirt for God's perfection and righteousness. Hebrews 10.10 puts it like this. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is a one-time act that through the cross, as we turn to Jesus, uh, as we give ourselves to him, as we repent of the things we've done wrong and choose to go his way, we are made holy, declared not guilty through the sacrifice of Jesus and for all time, not for that day, for all eternity. And so, we become a holy dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. He can live in us because we are made and declared perfect, pure and holy by the work of Jesus on the cross. Again, we need to get our, our heads around that and understand that. This is for everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus So how do we respond to that? And by the way, before we think about that, maybe there are some who have not yet done that. Not yet uh, turned from their own way of living. Uh, repenting is about saying sorry and turning from uh, living our own life our own way and choosing instead to, to try to live God's way. If you haven't done that, then you can do that today. 
we can help you with that. We can, there'll be people uh, after the service or in the second half of the service available to pray. Take that opportunity to come and, and allow them to talk to you some more about that or pray for you that you can make that decision today to turn to Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit and become a holy dwelling place for him to dwell in you. So we are declared uh, not guilty. We are made holy. How do we respond? Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, this is Paul again, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we are declared not guilty. We are made holy. We then have a choice to make day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. And that choice is to put off our old self, our old way of thinking, our old ways of behaving, and instead to put on the new self, this, this uh, reality of our holiness that God has granted to us through Jesus. To, to put that on. In other words, for that to become our reality, our lived reality day by day. Not just a, a status before God, but a, a way of living that impacts our day-to-day -day attitudes and our actions. That is our heart. That is our natural response to what God has done. Not that we'll say, well, I'm declared not guilty so I can do what I like. No. That we want to live in the reality of that purity. To become more pure day by day. How are you doing with that? If you're anything like me, not particularly well. Purity, yes, in our standing before God that cannot be changed, but not so much in our day-to-day -day attitudes and actions. 1 Peter 1, verses 1 to 2. To God's elect, Peter writes, that's anybody who knows and follows Jesus, to God's elect who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ. If you don't know what sanctify means, it, it literally means m to make holy. To sanctify something is to make it holy. So this verse is reminding us that that work of taking our status of holiness that we have before God in Jesus and turning it into who we are day by day in our lives is a work of the Holy Spirit in us to sanctify us, to make us holy in our attitudes and our actions, that that holiness will be a lived reality for us. And that shows itself, as Peter says here, in obedience to Jesus Christ, that, that more and more, as the Holy Spirit does that work purifying us, so we become more and more obedient to Jesus. Titus 2.14, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That is the work of the Spirit. To redeem us, to purify us, so that we become eager to do what is good. What does this have to do with fire? Well, fire is used in the refining process. So refining precious metals, gold, for example, the person would light a fire. I've got a picture. Yeah, that's a picture of the kind of thing that happens. You light a fire and you put the, the impure gold into the fire. Uh, and as, it, as the fire does its work, all the impurities of that impure gold rise to the top uh, of, of the, uh, the mix and the refiner scoops off all of those impurities, all that scum, all the things that isn't the precious metal is then scooped off and you're left with the, the pure metal, the pure gold. Remember the words of John the Baptist, I baptize with fire, he will baptize. I baptize with water, sorry, John says, he will baptize with fire. Water cleans us on the outside, fire goes deeper. Fire goes deep into our impurities, cleans us, from the inside. The fire of the Holy Spirit is working to bring out our entrenched impurities. 
working to refine us in practice in who we are and what we do. I regularly have heard uh, in a variety of places, churches uh, talking about individuals or people talking about themselves, having this idea of, well, this is just who I am and you just have to put up with it. This, this is, sorry, but this is just who I am. We don't get to say that as Christians. We just don't. Because the work of the Holy Spirit in us is constantly wanting to transform us, to move us on from those things that, well, this is just, I just like that. And so you just have to put up with it. No. That's a work of the Holy Spirit, to bring those impurities out to the surface. That as, the, as the fires of life hit, often those impurities suddenly appear, don't they? Those, those wrong thoughts, those wrong attitudes can pour out of us. But it's a sign of the work of the Holy Spirit to say we can, we can now ask the great refiner to remove those things, to scoop them away so that we can experience the purity that is a reality for us in Christ. There's a song we're going to sing later. It says this, Refiner's fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy. Is that your thinking? Is that where you are? Not just willing for the Spirit to purify us, but longing for Him to do that that we may live in a greater sense of purity through his work. Again, an opportunity to respond later uh, and to say yes to the Holy Spirit. Again, he will not force himself upon us, but we can say yes to him. Lord, come and do this refining work in me. Presence, purity, and passion. Another thing fire does is it heats, and we often talk about relationships in terms of temperature, or I'm a bit cold towards that person, or I'm warming to this person. And the the Bible does that too, and and uses some of those phrases. But I want to just point out a couple of uh, particular passages. There's there's one in um, Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. Song of Solomon, for those who don't know, is a, is a, a, a picture, if you like, of the love relationship between God and the church, played out through a, a married couple. And in uh, chapter 8, verse 6, the bride of the couple who is representing the church says this about love. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. This sense of a burning love and desire and passion for uh, the bridegroom who is God in the picture. Another verse, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Jeremiah speaks about God's word saying, his word is in my heart like a fire. This sense, again, of a passion about God's word, a, a, an uncontainable desire that is in him for the word of God. The disciples who are walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus after he's risen from the dead. Jesus, after he's revealed him who he is, and then he disappears, and they say this to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Do you have that burning fire for God in you? Or has it faded over the years? That perhaps you can remember a time where it, it was, there was a great passion for God and a great desire and, uh, and you were burning for him and desperate to meet with him and that has perhaps faded away. Again, a work of the Holy Spirit in us. Following the arrival of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, the disciples have a passion for God that never dims. We follow the story through, through all of Acts, through the letters, uh, some of which we've read. This passion for God that does not dim. The inextinguishable fire of the Holy Spirit overtakes them. And they were driven by this passion for God. Is that your reality today? I believe this morning the Holy Spirit wants to come and relight that fire for God in your heart. Paul, when he's writing to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, writes this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. What does he mean when he talks about the gift of God? He's, he goes on to say this, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The fanning into flame is the fanning uh, into life again of the Spirit's fire in us. 
the fire of the Holy Spirit can create again a greater passion for God in our hearts. And he can do that today if we are willing to say yes to him. A fresh passion for God, an increasing desire to live for him day by day. A greater passion for one another, others who know and follow him. An increase in love and compassion for the church, and I mean the people. A greater passion for the lost, an increasing eagerness and energy to seek and to save those who don't yet know God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And as I was pondering on this and praying about it, I was reminded of a picture that I used many years ago. And somebody actually said it recently as well. Uh, and that's to do with the, the pilot light of a, uh, of a boiler, if you like. I think I found a picture of one. There's this little light burning and... And in a boiler, that pilot light is always on. It never goes out. And if you like, that could represent the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, that he's not going to leave, he's not going, he's committed to us, and he's uh, always in us, and he's always there. We are always spiritually alive if we have given ourselves to God. But it's not enough to create heat, uh, to create power. Uh, And what we need is that moment when the heating clicks on and the next picture shows that 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 of the of the of the flame that begins to be then powerful to be able to do what it's called to do to be able to make the difference that it needs to make and have a sense again that that is a work that god wants to do in some of us this morning just to receive again the holy spirit to to allow him to say yes to him again setting that fire ablaze because it feels like sometimes, perhaps, that we someone's given us a, 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 a Porsche, a, a wonderful, incredible Porsche, and we have no fuel to run it. That, that this, this Christian life was supposed to be something other than what I'm experiencing. It's just become a hard slog. Like we have no fuel. Well, the Spirit wants to come and set a fire in our hearts to give us all that we need to have the energy to live for him and for it to have an impact on our day-to-day lives. So we're going to have some time to respond now. Those three areas, God's presence, that recognition again and realization of the fact that you are the dwelling place of God on earth. What does that mean to allow God to, to meet you in that and to help you to come to an understanding of that? Perhaps it's to do with purity and that sense of of wanting, yeah, I want this holiness that is a standing before God to be a reality more and more day by day in my life. Maybe there are some deep uh, impurities that you've never been able to remove. And God this morning is saying, come by the fire of the Spirit, I can bring them to the surface and scoop them away so that they're not there anymore. And then the passion, perhaps, just to have that fire burn in you. So Lord, as we come and respond to you. We want to thank you that this is all your work in us. We don't have to do follow any uh, rituals or rules or do anything other than say yes to you. And you will come and you will meet with us and you will be at work in us. Thank you for that. Lord, give us courage this morning to say yes to you. Amen.